One of the more popular, certainly more widely recommended approaches to managing change into production is Gitflow. I confess that I've never been a fan. I'm a continuous integration guy and Gitflow prevents real continuous integration. For a long time, I and people like me who value fast, efficient CI over feature branching have felt that we were kind of talking at the margins. I think that many, if not most people disagreed with us on this. However, one of my friends has recently had some success in moving the conversation on a bit. So I thought that this may be a good opportunity to explore Gitflow and its use in a little bit more detail. So what is Gitflow and why is it incompatible with continuous integration and continuous delivery? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. And if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. If you'd like to know more about my preferred approach to continuous integration and branching, check out my training course, Anatomy of a Deployment Pipeline, where I cover this in a lot more detail. Gitflow was invented in 2010 by Vincent Dreesen. This was the same year that my book, Continuous Delivery, was published. So Gitflow was certainly not designed with development approaches like CD in mind, really. This is the Gitflow model. It's based around two branches, usually called develop and master. This approach is based on the use of Git, hence the name. And even though one of these branches is called master, the name choices are somewhat arbitrary, really. It doesn't mean the same thing as master in, does in Git. Git is a distributed version control system, meaning that every clone of the repo is the same. So the selection of a one true branch for master is purely by convention, not imposed by Git itself. Supporting these branches are a bunch of others, feature branches, release branches and hotfix branches. So five different kinds of branch in all. But in practice, there may be many more branches than that in play because there'll be multiple versions of feature, hotfix and release branches. This is a complex branching strategy. And as I said in the intro, works against continuous integration. Having said all of that, I have employed branching strategies like these on projects in the past, but that was before I learned how to do continuous integration properly. So what do I mean by it works against CI? Here's one of my favorite descriptions of continuous integration from the inventors. What if the engineers didn't hold on to modules for more than a moment? What if they made their correct change and presto, everyone's computer instantly had that version of the module? Continuous integration is about establishing and maintaining a shared accurate view of the state of the system that we're working on. We aren't guessing whether our changes will work together. We're checking frequently, multiple times per day, continuously. Here's another quote from the C2 wiki description that I like. The fundamental assumption of continuous integration that there's only one interesting version, the current one. Let's look at where we can achieve that clear, correct picture of the current version in Gitflow. Is it here on the develop branch? Well, it's close, but it's not definitive. What if we evaluate our changes as we commit them to the develop branch? Is this really the truth? No, this isn't the collection of changes that will definitively end up in production. We may have hotfixes that haven't been merged back into develop yet. So develop and master are for a short time out of step. Maybe we made some changes to develop that we decided at the last minute not to release for some reason. So all of our evaluations up to that point were based on incorrect assumptions. I can imagine fans of Gitflow at this point now smiling and saying Dave doesn't understand. We work to keep the developer master in step. Well, let's pose the question the other way around. If developer and master are kept really close together in terms of changes, What's the point of having both? And so risking them being even for a moment out of step. Why don't we instead use our version control systems to do its job and control the versions that we're interested in? So I can imagine using the develop branch as the truth, but that would eliminate the need for the master branch and the hotfix branch altogether. 
merging all of the changes into develop, whether new development hot fix or bug fix, and releasing changes into production direct from there. But this is now just continuous integration or maybe continuous delivery, not Gitflow. We can think of the master hotfix and release branches as release supporting aspects of this approach. They're all focused on managing change into production. This is obviously important. The truth of our system is what ends up in production. So I think that should be the focus of our evaluation. So we could decide, instead of treating develop as the truth, to evaluate our changes every time we merge a change to master. This would be accurate in terms of the changes, since that's where we release from master into production. This is the interesting current version. The only, the, that only works in a continuous integration sense, though, if we're doing that multiple times per day. By definition, continuous integration says that everyone's merging their changes together at least daily. We are also still left with the special cases of hot fixes or bug fixes. What's the current version now? The assumption that I think is built into Gitflow is that we do this merge when we think our work on a feature or bug fix is complete. If we're waiting until we think we're finished before getting feedback on our work, though, that's crap feedback. It doesn't really support development. And it's certainly nothing close to continuous integration. So we need to up the rate of merging to master. The most sensible way to do that is to eliminate the develop and hotfix branches. And now, yet again, we're back to continuous integration. As well as all of these release supporting branches, there are feature branches. I've spoken about my thoughts on feature branching before in previous videos. It's really the same line of reasoning that we've just explored for release though. As a developer, I want the clearest possible signal that my changes are safe to release. And I would much prefer to find out that my changes aren't safe to release close to the point from at which I begin to diverge from safety, rather than after weeks of now wasted work. Even if the work isn't completely wasted, I'm not where I thought I was. Now I've more work to do than I planned because I need to get back to safety. So I'd like feedback on the safety of my changes frequently, so that if I do make a mistake, I'll find out really quickly so that my mistake will have been a small one. What does safety mean in this context? Well, it really means that our changes are releasable. The change is of production quality. It does the job we expect it to. It works along with everybody else's changes. This is the problem that continuous integration was invented to solve. So, in a perfect world, what we'd really like is constant, you may think continuous, feedback on our changes. Every moment, you know that your changes work along with mine, and we both know that our changes together are good enough to release. The problem is that the world isn't perfect, so there are some compromises. In reality, I don't really care whether your code compiles with mine while you're in the middle of typing character by character. That would be too continuous. So we break it up, even in continuous integration. There are times when I'm working on my local copy and you on yours. But if we want this semi-continuous picture of the combined safety of our changes, then we can't afford to wait for too long. In continuous integration, most experts agree that daily integration, although too infrequent to be ideal, is just about good enough to qualify as continuous integration. So if your feature takes longer than a day to create, you can't wait till it's finished and so do feature branching before you merge your changes. If your feature takes less than a day to create, what's the point of creating a feature branch? My preferred way to organise all of this is that I will work in my local repo on my copy of master. I'll commit changes locally, frequently, usually just after the test that I'm working on has passed. After every successful local commit, I will push my changes to origin master, where that triggers the first stage in my deployment pipeline, which is really just continuous integration. 
Some version of this is sometimes referred to as trunk-based development, though I confess I don't really think that there's any real difference between this version of trunk-based development and continuous integration. You aren't really continuously integrating if you aren't merging to trunk at least once per day. Now, Gitflow adds all of these other branches. Branches, by definition, are defined to isolate or hide change. Continuous integration, by definition, is designed to expose changes. These are kind of mutually exclusive ideas. At the start of this episode, I mentioned some recent moves on this topic. These are down to a friend of mine, Brian Finster, who reached out to the inventor of Gitflow, Vincent, and asked him to revise his explanation in the context of continuous delivery. I think it says a lot for Vincent that he did so. Vincent's article that introduced Gitflow now has an update. Here's a snippet. If your team is doing continuous delivery of software, I would suggest to adopt a much simpler workflow, like GitHub flow, instead of trying to shoehorn Gitflow into your team. Now, clearly, I've taken a step further than Vincent did. I contend that if you aim to practice continuous integration, not the its bigger brother continuous delivery, you need to find an alternative to Gitflow. There are a few other things that Vincent says that I disagree with too. Continuous delivery certainly for more than simple web apps that he refers to. Um, ask Tesla, Ericsson or Siemens if you don't know what I mean. But I do want to thank him for making this change. I think it was an honest uh, and a respectable move. Thank you, Vincent. Brian wasn't done, though. The number one hit when you Google for Gitflow is on the Atlassian site. It now reads as follows. Gitflow is a legacy Git workflow. This was originally disruptive and novel strategy for managing Git branches. Gitflow has fallen in popularity in favour of trunk-based workflows, which are now considered best practices for modern continuous software development and DevOps practices. Gitflow can also be challenging to use with continuous integration and continuous delivery. This post details Gitflow for historical purposes. In Vincent Dreesen's revision, he mentioned GitHub flow as an alternative. This is certainly a simpler approach than Git flow, but it's really just describing a feature branch model. In GitHub flow, you do all of the work on a branch until you think it's finished. Uh, so the problem is speed and accuracy of feedback once, once again. The description that Vincent links to doesn't mention continuous integration or testing of any form at all. I think that's a big mistake. Uh, so I wouldn't recommend GitHub flow either. I think that this omission of any mention of testing in the descriptions of both Git flow and GitHub flow is a significant one. To me, both of these strategies read as, if you'll forgive me, sticking plaster fixes for teams that don't do a great job of automated testing. The slowdown is that inaccurate feedback enforced by both of these approaches is a problem for continuous integration. It means that we wait too long to find that we've made a mistake. But it's inherent to the approaches. Their aim is to give you time to look at and check your work thoroughly. I think that speeding up the feedback cycle is a much better solution to this. It brings the problem into clearer focus. It allows us to evaluate definitive collections of changes together rather than a best guess approximation of what is likely to be deployed into production. The real issue here is how confident are we that our changes are safe? Gitflow and GitHub flow try to make the change process safer by slowing things down, allowing more time, presumably, for developers to think and check their changes. Manually or with automated tests on one of, sev on one of the several branches. But as a result of slowing things down and reducing the frequency of integration, the testing on these branches, even if it is very thorough, evaluates collections of changes that aren't the same as what end up in production, so it's not definitive. I think that continuous integration makes people nervous because we're exposing changes before developers are finished with their, their features that they're building. This is a big change in how we approach our work. It forces us to think and work more incrementally. 
But this approach more closely represents the reality of software development. In reality, this incremental approach at the heart of continuous integration works not just for simple websites, but for some of the most complex software systems in the world. Taking a genuine engineering approach to software development sometimes means that we have to face difficult realities. In this case, I suppose it comes down to what is the biggest risk. Working so that our software is always working, as we do in continuous integration, or even working so our software is always releasable, as we do in continuous delivery, or slowing things down and working in isolation and keeping our fingers crossed that at the end our changes will work alongside everybody else's. The data for that is in. Continuous integration works better, even though it means adapting the way in which we approach our work to make it work. Thank you for watching.